My name is Yael Faber. Um, I'm a theatre director and playwright. Um, I have a very particular approach to the way that I work with actors. Uh, and my, my work is very much split into two bodies of material. The one is I do adaptations of classics. Um, and the other is that I work with testimony. So I work with the survivors of particular experiences and create theatre texts and performances out of their testimonies and their life experiences. Both of these uh, particular um, genres that I work in uh, work with truth in, in, in a similar way, although the result um, is different in the way that it manifests as a, as a theatrical event. But the, um, the approach that I have to working with actors um, is from a very classical understanding of what theatre is. Um, and that is that it is, a, it is a communal event, it is a ritual in which um, the community gathers in, in a space and individuals who are self-designated within that society tell stories. And these stories are either um, direct transmissions of their life experiences or they are channeling stories, be they ancient or modern, that somehow encapsulate the, um, the human condition and what people are living today. And very often this echoes back to the Greek tragedies. Um, I like to say that the Greek tragedies are, they have a way of showing us just how far we haven't come in several thousand years. Very true. Can you give me a couple of examples of, of one of each, perhaps? Sure. Um, well, when I've adapted the classics, for example, I've worked with the, um, the Aristia trilogy, um, Aeschylus's Aristia trilogy, um, and I set it in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of South Africa. I am a South African. Um, I now reside in Canada, but um, I was born and raised there. And uh, South Africa is an extraordinary country to have come from uh, in its relationship to the truth. And so I worked um, with a cast of actors to explore what it meant to face the truth, to face the events of the past through the device of the ancient Greek classic of the Aristia trilogy. Um, in the, that's one example. In the, in the genre of testimony, um, I have a body of work, um, three South African plays. Um, uh, as an example, one is called He Left Quietly, which um, spoke of the experiences of Duma Kamalo, who has since passed away, but he was a survivor of South Africa's death row. Um, and he was a political prisoner who was condemned uh, to death for a crime he didn't commit. Um, and his experience has spoken a very profound way about just um, how far gone the, the, the justice system in South Africa was and somehow encapsulated what human beings were subjected to inside the system. Um, and Duma himself performed the piece along with two other actors. Um, and so these are examples of, of how, how I work. Um, I've actually currently got a show on, um, on the West End in London, which is Arthur Miller's The Crucible, which I find quite extraordinary because it ends tomorrow night. Um, and at exactly the same time, I'll be giving this speech called um, The Power of the Truth. And just a stone's throw from here was the events of The Crucible um, that Arthur Miller was depicting, which again is a relationship to the truth, a group of young girls who developed hysterical symptoms um, but I like to describe them as the, um, the boils on the body of a sick society breaking out. Many people identify the girls as the issue, but in fact they were expressing what was the underbelly of what was going on in the society. And this is the way I work, is essentially that whether we're um, creating lies, falsehoods, fiction, or the creative act of, of um, telling stories through theater, we find ways to create narratives that speak about a vein of truth that is actually running through the society. You know, I circle that back to what you said about the Greek tragedies, and we haven't really changed very much. Right, you know, the human condition is what it is. Um, I, you know, I, I think it's possible for the individual to transcend um, what are our tendencies to, um, to work with uh, the malady of what can manifest as neurosis um, and, and makes us capable of extraordinary evils in society. But I think the flip side of that is precisely what makes us heroic. And this is what the Greek tragedies deal with. It's what most drama deals with is um, 
in the face of extraordinary experiences, who do we show up to be? How do we manifest our true selves inside um, the context, the, the given social context? Um, and so the Greek tragedies, um, you know, people gathered in arenas, um, uh, you know, in Aristotle's Poetics, uh, you know, theatre was understood to be the city healing itself. Uh, theatre is an act of healing. It's an act of um, societal, psychological health in which we we come to face as a community um, what is uh, troubling or dark or difficult um, within that society, and that we go home better citizens because of it. Now, theatre has taken on another form in many ways. It's become a very commercial enterprise. Um, so that, and the more economy is involved in that, the more it is a capitalist venture, the further it takes us from our truth, because we don't necessarily want to pay to hear difficult truths. We will very often pay for um, an anaesthetizing experience. Um, and growing up in South Africa, this is what really shaped me because um, I, uh, I can recall very well at six years old being taken to see the musical um, Annie. Um, and as I came out of the theater um, on my birthday, I saw the horizon burning and it was the Soweto uprisings. Um, but we as a white audience were experiencing musical theater. Um, and as a teenager sitting in the market theater, which was um, famous for the advent of protest theater, and experiencing um, uh, playwrights and artists who it seemed to me were bringing me um, and those of us sitting in those rooms the only access to the truth that we had. And so I understood um, in those seminal years of my life that you could either use storytelling to put people to sleep or to awaken them to what the truth is. And the way I suppose this circles back in towards why I've been invited here and what I'm very excited to um, be in contact with in this currency of people who are dealing with psychological health and um, or more the maximizing of the of the potential for uh, possibility inside people um, in the in the coaching tradition is that um, I don't believe it's possible to access our finest potential without facing the truth. Um, I think that the currency of truth is the only way to um, to bring about um, a healthful individual and thus a healthful society. And when I say health, I don't mean it in the sense of um, baseline survival. I mean the full potential of what the human spirit is possible of. I, I also, it's, it's very clear, I appreciate it. Um, I'll pull out one little piece that I heard. Um, if, if I heard you correctly, classical theater way back when mm -hmm. was performed as a communal ritual, which I'm going to add some words here, was an exploration of difficult subjects. Yes. Is that right? So there's the line to coaches to me, because all of what we're doing is about facilitating exploration. Right. And then if we put that together with what you're saying about the truth, which I wholeheartedly agree, um, we've got the frame within which the coaching community is trying to work. Exactly. And I, you know, I, I think that there's, um, um, just like in theatre, there's probably a tendency inside coaching, inside anything that is searching for um, a way for us to, to, to reach our potential, there are shortcuts that can be taken that lead to a kind of um, unearned optimism. And I'm very interested in this question because we all know when we're witnessing theatre um, that when you're dealing with difficult questions, if you don't dramatically earn the right to the catharsis which leads us towards a confrontation with the truth and, and that you in a sense, birth into a new possibility um, of a searing kind of honesty as an individual and as the community. It's immediately apparent when you're having a theatrical experience where you don't buy what the character transforms towards. Um, and I think this is probably the same in the coaching tradition, um, that one, one will be aware of when you're invited to embrace an optimism that is not earned yet. And I think that there's a... Um, there's only one way through uh, towards our full potential, um, that transcendent potential that overcomes whatever we've lived. We are only what we've lived. We can't deny where we come from. 
but it's the engagement with the self that makes um, the, the, the true potential to be realized possible. And this is true in the theatrical um, uh, experience, whether we're witnessing a play or I know the way I work with actors. We have to go through a very particular experience in the rehearsal room. I'm aware, I'm keenly aware that there is a, a direct transmission from what I invite actors to, to achieve inside the room is what they will transmit to the audience. And I believe that any profession or skill or tradition that is hoping to lead others towards a greater sense of truth has to have gone through that experience themselves, has to have a very deep engagement with the truth and, on, and an honesty within themselves. Yeah, no, it is very, very close. Um, and I love the metaphor. I can, I can step into it. Um, as a coach, you have to be able to recognize and separate from what your client is telling you. Where is the truth? How far have they gone into themselves? And where is the mask or whatever? Um, in the same way that, obviously, if you're watching a performance, the strong performance comes from the engagement with the truth. And we can all recognize on some level when it isn't there. Precisely. Um, I think that the, the interesting um, uh, facet to, to what theatre does, and, and I think to what any of us do with our lives, is that there is a creative act involved in which we, we create the narration that we then decide to embrace. It has to be rooted in a truth, but memory, just like story, is a, um, there are shards of disorganized um, events. So I know when I work with survivors of human rights violations and we're creating a testimony out of that, um, I use very particular techniques to tap into memory, to, to rediscover details that may have been lost, um, not because I'm searching for um, um, uh, uh, the approach of um, th the therapeutic necessity of detail, but the theatrical necessity, because storytelling comes from the details, the human details. Um, but as one rediscovers those details and those events, they're not chronologically recalled. Um, there's a profound act of remembrance. I'm very interested in that word, remembrance, because you have to remember it. You have to put it back together again. And so when I'm working with um, the subject, the, the person whose testimony I'm gathering before they become a performer, um, I, I like to work in a way that invites them into the chaos of that. So at first, if I ask somebody, tell me about your life, they'll come up with a very um, uninteresting series of seminal events that they think are, are important um, that in fact don't qualify as anything um, unique or um, that I can make um, a story um, from that will be engaging for the audience. But um, once I start to invite them into just recalling details, um, memory has not organized itself in a chronological way. Um, but there is a creative act of then stringing those beads together. And of course, within that process, um, between myself and that uh, performer or testifier, is what to leave out and what to put in. And inside that, of course, becomes a, a process as human beings about what we decide to remember, what, which facts of our lives we decide to embrace. But I think with the discernment of what we choose to then create as our dominating narrative becomes what defines us in our capacity to go forward, as long as denial is not involved. We have to put it all on the table. And then without editing it, editing it so that it is more digestible for the audience, but rather how do we organize those events that it becomes comprehensible. And in that comprehension, in the coherence of the organization of those events, comes a capacity for healing. Absolutely. Um, what do you do when you detect significant denial in either an actor who you're training or in someone who is giving testimony? In the audition process, um, because once I'm in a room with somebody, I have to keep pursuing what the truth is. Um, but of course there are individuals who are not ready to face that. Um, and because they're not there to necessarily 
volunteer themselves for some kind of therapeutic process. In fact, I warn specifically against that. I'm not a therapist, I'm not trained, in, I'm a storyteller. So if we're there for the endeavor of healing that individual and thus the community, we, I think we'll collapse under the weight of grandiosity. But if we understand our role, which is quite simply to tell a story, a truthful story, um, in my audition process, um, I, I'm very careful to, uh, to suss out how far that person is capable of going into the truth at this point in time. So I very recently, my most recent testimonial work um, is called Nirpaya and it's, a, it's from the Indian word fearless and it's based on the rape and death of a young woman who um, died of her injuries in Delhi after being gang raped on a bus um, in, in 2012. And um, I was invited to India by a young woman who um, had suffered from sexual abuse as a child. And she had contacted me after the death of the young woman saying, um, I know, in, she contacted me the morning after this young woman died. Um, I had posted something on Facebook. I was devastated, as most people were. There's so, sometimes there's a story that just breaks the, the, into the unconscious of the public and brings to the surface what we've all been denying. And that incident was one of them. And Purna Jagannathan, who's the woman who contacted me from um, Bombay um, on Facebook, she said, I know that what happened on the bus uh, on that bus was only possible because of my silence and all the other women who've suffered sexual violence who have stayed silent. I am complicit and it's time for us to all step up and break the silence. And because we, she had seen another testimonial work of mine in New York 10 years earlier, she said, I know you can put these stories together for us and we're ready to speak and you have to come and bring your skill. And so she, she paid out of her own money for me to go to, to Bombay um, with my daughter, she paid for both of us, and she's an actress, she's, um, you know, um, but with her own humble means um, for me to go there, and we started to gather testimony. And then we set about in this very interesting process of me Skyping, we, we put a, a call out on social media saying if you're a survivor of sexual um, uh, violence um, as a child or adult, um, and would be willing to be a part of this production, um, uh, uh, please come forward. And then I interviewed a series of people on Skype and in that process I had to do a very delicate um, but very, very uh, penetrating um, series of questions to know how far they could go because we could not afford to have anybody in the room who would still be engaged in the currency of denial. Um, and so before I've even got to the rehearsal room, I, of course one gets to the rehearsal room and you'll, you'll encounter denial that, that sits at a very unconscious level that is dressing itself up as all kinds of other things. And then it's my job to, to gently disarm that defense system that has been, for very good reasons, constructed. It's, it's um, striking to me. I've never really thought about it before, except in preparing for this interview and reading some of your material and looking. It's very, very close. We aren't therapists, whether we're coaches or we're ther theater uh, practitioners. practitioners, thank you. Um, but we need to learn the delicacy of respecting people as they are and not pushing them where they are not ready to go. That's right. Uh, you, I know in theatre, because you are accountable finally to a product, I have to open a show. Um, and a show that can speak to the audience, and a show that can sustain itself as a small ecology. The cast is a very particular kind of hothouse, and you have to keep those little orchids alive. Um, and if you, have, um, if you have pushed people beyond what they're willing or capable of going to, the places that they are able to go to, willing is another matter because um, I think it's very interesting. People are often, um, they, they unconsciously know where they can go to, but their defense systems are still extremely sophisticated. Um, so are mine. All of ours are. Oh, There's, I don't, you know, I, unless you um, have, have um, undergone the most extraordinary events in your life and you've worked with them in a particular way, I think we all operate at a very high and sophisticated level of various forms of denial. We have to, to survive. Um, but, but if I push too far, it will bring the little house of cards down, and so I'm 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 in service to something that 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 is necessarily delicate, um, and has to survive, um, and so I have to engage with it at a level of very very fine integrity. Um, 
But as I say, it, th there's also something very interesting about um, working with testimony with theatre performers because once you have this production up and it's beginning to resonate enormously with the public, for example, as Nirbhaya does, because I have extraordinary stories to tell about what that's done to the audience. Um, but then, of course, the individuals start to go on a process where they start to shift in their feeling towards their own narrative. And that starts to change the nature of the performance. And then as a director, you have to still keep a certain product alive because you, if the performers get ahead of the process of the audience, you have to keep bridging that gap. And this is where performance starts to step in. So it's a very, very fascinating process that I'm filled with questions about. I, you know, I don't go forward advocating that it is um, a process that I don't have um, my own uh, very um, uh, um, uh, deep questions that I have to keep asking myself about the integrity of what we do and what it takes to keep what we've created alive. Yeah, I, um, we've been talking a lot, I've been talking a lot with other people at this conference about the importance of the container that we create for whatever the project is, whether it's in a coaching session, in your rehearsal room, and how our responsibility as the coach, as the director, as the playwright is to, to protect that safety and to protect the integrity, and I, that's what I think I'm hearing. Yes. Yes, if there's not a very high level of a high level currency of integrity in the room, um, I always say to actors, my task is to create a room that feels safe enough that we can get dangerous. Because if there is no risk, if there's no risk in that room, we're not going to break any kind of ground. We're not if we are not pushing past um, those levels of defence. If we are not pushing past areas of safety that we've constructed for ourselves for years, then we're not inviting the audience to venture into new territory, and then what's the point of the endeavor? Because people don't come to the theater, I don't think, unless you're going to the anesthetizing form of theater that I spoke about earlier, but if people are coming to the theater to be awakened on some level, you are shining a light slightly ahead or much further ahead in the process and saying, walk this way, it's, it's safe, but it is um, an endeavor that's not going to feel like you are cotton wrapped in your safety zones anymore. It's going to be a heart quickening, um, uh, possibly even um, difficult experience. But again, it's an earned, and this is where the word earned comes in, it's an earned sense of achievement once you reach your catharsis. And, and, and that's why it's so clear theatrically when you have not earned that as an as an actor, you have not earned that as a director. If I'm not willing to create a room that is encased in a sense of integrity, but an integrity that says, let's go further, let's go further, we can go further. But again, sensing how much can the vessel take before it breaks. Um, yeah, and there's a piece of it too, I think, and again, this is true in, in what I do as well as in what you do. Um, of us being willing, you being willing, mm -hmm. me being willing to go there yes. either first or at the very least alongside. Yes. And unless we don't have that capacity, I don't think that we can progress to those levels. That's exactly right. And I, what's also very interesting to me is that as a, as a whether it's a coach, a therapist, a theater director, um, one has to assure the, 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 the subject, the person that you're working with, or the group you're working with, that you are in the currency of honesty, and that you have earned that currency of honesty through your own integration of your own truth. But I know as a director um, that I can't join the group in that process live in that moment, because someone has to be flying the plane. So it's very, very similar because the, the individual wants to know that you have walked this path, that you understand it, that you've earned certain things, that you don't consider yourself above the group, but that you are capable to lead. And, and it's like getting people through terrain that, is, um, that can be treacherous. And you're there with them, you're walking through the trenches, but at the same time you have a map, you have a plan. Um, I don't want to hear from the pilot as we're going through turbulence that he's panicking as much as I am. <laughs> oh, um, definitely. I want to know he's done turbulence many, many times. That, but he's on the plane too. He's at, he's in as much risk as I am. But he has knowledge and skill. And I think that's where the theatre director and the writer is very similar to the coach or the therapist. <laughs>